Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Eric Johnson, uh, a director as, uh, at SMP and uh, senior technology editor at thejoc.com. And I also would like to introduce Shalab, uh, who is the CEO of TradeMo. Welcome both. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, uh, demerge and detention charges within the realm of the shipping and logistics industry. You guys ready to start? Yeah, thanks, Vail. For the introduction and um, Eric, uh, welcome again to our podcast. Uh, had a lot of fun last time um, and looking forward to more uh, such podcasts with you and looking forward to today's one also. Yeah, thanks so much for having me back. It's uh, It was a great conversation. Looking forward to another interesting one today. Great. So let me pose this first question to Eric. And uh, Eric, what exactly are Demerage and detention charges within the realm of the shipping and logistics industry? And how do they contribute to the financial dynamics of businesses involved in global trade? Yeah. Um, so yeah, good, good level set question to start the discussion with. Um, so just at a very basic level, um, detention, demerge, often lumped together called D&D, um, they are uh, different charges within the context of uh, the sort of uh, movement of a container, uh, but they they cover very different things. So just to just to sort of describe what each of them is, uh, demurrage is the storage cost um, assessed by the container terminal uh, on a box that sits longer than a prescribed number of days. That's either in a contract that a shipper has. Uh, to move that container once it's available off the ship and available out of the container terminal. Uh, so any days or time that it goes past that that predetermined day, number of days, you get charged uh, essentially a storage fee. Uh, detention is once that container leaves the terminal, it also has a certain number of days before it has to be returned, either full or usually empty. Uh, and if you go past that preset number of days that's either in the contract or uh, otherwise determined, uh, then again, you would be assessed a late fee for having kept hold of the container uh, for longer than you should have. Um, in terms of, I, I believe you asked about the financial uh, sort of dynamics uh, involved in, in detention to merge. Theoretically, they should be very minimal, right? These are These are sort of clauses in contracts that are intended to motivate the rapid evacuation of containers out of terminals so they're not occupying space on very valuable uh, acreage uh, near ports or in ports. Uh, and likewise, the, the fees are on the, on the detention side are meant to get those containers back into the system and not being, you know, stored in perpetuity. We've all, we've all driven in cities and seen containers, ocean containers sitting on the side of roads somewhere my immediate thought is, oh, I wonder what the detention is on that. Um, so ideally, they wouldn't occupy much from a financial uh, perspective relative to the cost of ocean freight. Uh, in reality, they have increased that they've started occupying a larger percentage uh, over the past decade. It's always been a problem, right? It's always been something sort of a thorn in the side um, for importers and exporters. I think what's changed over the last few years is it's gone from being a nuisance to being a major problem and a major financial problem that has gotten the eyes and ears of CFO, the financial division within uh, these companies, because it's, you know, I, I, I've lost track of the number of shippers who have told me that their detention demerge, especially during the pandemic, but even after that has run into the seven figures, into seven figures, right? A lot of people are in five and 10 figures, uh, five and six figures. When you start to get to seven figures, it's very hard to just sort of wash this away as a nuisance. It's actually starts to become a financial problem. Absolutely agree. Very good. Shalab, uh, could you elaborate on the primary causes behind D&D &D charges? Yeah, I think uh, uh, as uh, as far as uh, the standard clauses behind uh, application of D and D charges is concerned, so that has been very well covered by Eric. Um, but I would like to elaborate more on what uh, Eric mentioned that in last couple of years, uh, this has become a major problem, uh, especially uh, during COVID times and since then. And I think 
one of the reasons why dnd charges have run into seven figures and uh, it also lately uh, got uh, got concerns from uh, us government uh, port authorities uh, fmc and all uh, is one because of port congestion right i think uh, since the time of covid there has been a lot of congestion on ports and, and some of the major ports uh, which naturally causes delays in handling cargo and then causes demerge and detention and um, then uh, other issues which a lot of shippers and vcos faces with respect to how the overall documentation and administration is managed right so if there is any kind of incomplete or inaccurate uh, documentation and trade compliances have been changing very rapidly uh, across uh, different countries so there is a chance that the shipper or bco is not well prepared with all the required documentation that could cause uh, con longer container dwell times on the ports right and similarly that could cause your uh, customs clearance to be delayed uh, if you're not prepared with all the necessary set of documents uh, uh, the inspection process is getting delayed um, the other uh, reason why uh, uh, actually these delays might be happening is because of how efficiently all the equipments are being managed, right? So whether it is container chases or handling machinery, uh, first of all, do we have adequate machinery and equipments uh, at different ports, yards, terminals, or uh, uh, is there a sufficient workforce to manage them? If not, then it could result into uh, uh, delays. Um, how uh, streamlined communication is between different stakeholders, whether it is uh, port authorities, uh, shipping lines, terminal operators, uh, the intermediaries uh, who are responsible for uh, taking control of the cargo, uh, it could lead to multiple types of misunderstandings and coordination issues. And I think uh, just uh, from the contracting perspective where uh, the number of free days are defined, uh, sometimes that could be a bit complex for especially uh, uh, more, more mid-market or smaller uh, consignees to understand. And, and that could also lead to some kind of understandings, which is why the demerage and retention charges sometimes run into figures um, which are not expected uh, by, the, uh, by the BCOs and uh, cause a major concern. So, yeah, that would Thank be you. Um, Eric, how do uh, d, d charges influence the efficiency of supply chains and the overall operational expenses incurred by businesses? Uh, so I, I think I alluded to this a little earlier, right? If you think about the, the origin of these charges, it was to ensure that shippers were not keeping their boxes in container terminals at their own bet for their own benefit, you know, it, for an a undetermined amount of time, right? That that a that only benefits really one party, the the importer essentially. Um, everybody else sort of suffers. The terminal gets clogged up with boxes that are not moving, which inhibits you know kind of uh, management of the yard. Uh, the terminal uh, operator has to deal with that. The container line. Uh, has to deal with a yard that would be overflowing with uh, import containers that are not moving, uh, affecting how quickly it can unload and and, and uh, discharge containers and then reload export containers. And then, uh, you know, I think this is something, all of these were things that we saw during the pandemic kind of at a, at a historic level. Uh, what we also saw was other shippers, you know, Shalab referenced the mid-market shipper, we saw a lot of shippers that did not have extremely favorable uh, demurrage terms get impacted significantly by companies that did. So if you have, for instance, a big box retailer that has a lot of free time in, uh, in their contract, maybe as much as 30 days, potentially, uh, that's going to tie up space in the terminal and that's going to influence or impact shippers that don't have such favorable terms. If if a uh, if that box is not retrievable because there are so many containers mm -hmm. laden containers on the yard, you're going to impact. You're going to incur uh, demurrage through no fault of your own because other importers' boxes are sort of clogging that terminal. Right. So you can understand 
the the thought process behind this and similarly the, the the container line wants its box back it doesn't make money with the box it it out, absent detention fees it doesn't make money if the box is stuck somewhere at an inland distribution center or or a ramp somewhere and is not moving back to the origin to be reloaded uh with very lucrative car uh, freight right so um you can understand that sort of from an efficiency standpoint, the need to have some sort of motivation to get these boxes moving in both directions. Um, you know, from an operational expenses perspective, uh, you know, terminals, and we've had this described to us, Journal of Commerce, we've had this described to us very clearly by, by terminals, whether it's a, you know, private terminal operator or a port authority that runs its own terminals, if you're having to move boxes to get to boxes that need to move because someone has picked it up, uh, a drainage provider has come to pick it up, that's a cost that's incurred. Every time a box is moved on a yard, there's a cost that's incurred, right? So the, they're always thinking, how can we flow these term these containers out of the terminal as quickly as possible? And those rebound into operational costs, right? And so those have to be assessed to someone, whether it's directly to their customer, which is the, the carrier, or to the to uh, the the shipper or the drainage provider, someone is paying those costs. Someone has to reimburse the terminal for essentially all of that work. And one of the one of the inefficiencies that's created by all of this is that you often have parties such as a drainage provider that are not actually anywhere on the contract between the container line and the and the shipper that are essentially paying a fee on behalf of their own customer the shipper but they weren't part of the contract that was involved in in demurrage or detention at all so you have these very clunky sort of uh, commercial relationships that uh have to fit within a, the legal contract of which sometimes the terminal the terminal is assessing a fee to the drainage provider and neither the terminal nor the drainage provider, are even in the contract is specifying what the free days are. So it's a lot of inefficiencies are caused, but you can't wipe away detention to merge or else there'd be no motivation to move those, those boxes efficiently. Thank you for that. Right. The next question is for Shalab. Uh, Shalab, from your experience, what are some practical measures that companies can take to preemptively manage D&D charges and streamline their logistics operations? Yeah, uh, well, uh, very, uh, uh, I would say very important question. And I think uh, this is a function of, first of all, visibility, um, right? I think um, shippers or BCOs today, uh, consignees, they need to have as much visibility as possible, uh, starting from the expected time of arrival of their cargo, uh, the any congestion uh, on the current ports and terminals that they are expecting their uh, cargo to be received. Um, second is uh, preparedness, right? How prepared they are with all the documentation, uh, all the um, customs clearance processes, how is their uh, communication with, with their intermediaries uh, streamlined, um, how much prepared they are um, uh, with any kind of fees that has to be paid uh, at the port or terminal uh, or the or during uh, to the customs, right? So ensuring that they are not uh, any delays happening just because of uh, delays in payment of any kind of uh, taxes, fees, or uh, anything. Um, then uh, preparedness in terms of uh, their drainage providers. Like, have they given all the necessary set of documents, shipping instructions, um, permits uh, for their drainage providers to uh, pick up uh, and uh, move the containers uh, in the right time? Uh, do they are they aware about the cargo's weights or dimensions uh, so that they can uh, plan the pickup uh, accordingly? Um, how prepared are the warehouses where they are moving these particular containers? Uh, to receive their goods, right? So it's an entire chain uh, where the delays can happen uh, beyond the free days. And uh, the better uh, shipper is prepared, uh, 
and have more uh, streamlined uh, line of communication uh, with all the different stakeholders, I think there are better chances to avoid any kind of uh, delays. Um, and I think lastly, just to understand the contracting terms better, as Eric also mentioned, right? Like having no visibility into what are my free days on this particular port or terminal, right? Um, so that uh, is definitely goes a long way, just being aware about their rights, uh, about uh, uh, how they need to be built, when they need to be built, uh, and uh, when they can dispute, uh, all those things better a lot. Yeah, if, if I could just yeah. maybe add a little, yeah. you know, perspective on that as well. I think most, you know, every shipper of any size is moving goods through different terminals, right? They're not just using one single terminal. And there's a lot of variance between between carriers and different terminals about how much visibility you get into when a container is actually available, which starts the clock ticking yeah. on when free time ends. So Agreed. I, I think the more you can homogenize or normalize what that looks like across the different terminals and carriers you use, the better you're able to manage everything and not just have things, those anomalies kind of slip through the cracks and turn into big uh, D and D problems. Yeah, no, I think, and uh, just to add to Eric's point, sometimes there could be delays which are beyond the control of a shipper, right. And which could be, port related issues uh, due to infrastructure issues, uh, lack of workforce, um, any other delays, right? And understanding your contractual rights or uh, in general, as in how then the free day period will be extended um, uh, will also be helpful. Also uh, understanding that how the notice of uh, container availability will be provided either to the shipper or to the dredge providers in advance. And uh, uh, if any exceptions are happening, any uh, uh, delays are happening from the terminal side, that are, then are they extending the notice and so on. So all those uh, things would also go a long way uh, in once managing their detention cost. Yep. Continuing with Eric, considering the regulatory landscape, how do existing regulations and industry standards impact the assessment and management of D&D charges? And are there any upcoming regulatory ch changes that businesses should be mindful of? Ooh, so that's a different, that's a we could spend a whole hour just on this one <laughs> question. Uh, so I would say standards are, I'll just start with that standards are, um, sort of few and far to come by. I think as as we as sort of alluded to a second ago, I there's not really any um or or I should, should say historically there was not really any sort of standardized invoice or time frame for invoice that was required by by um law. That changed with um a rewrite of the US you know this is in the US at least uh the US um ocean Shipping Reform Act, uh, which was uh, passed, the OSTRA 22 was passed in, in mid-22. Um, it That attempted to create some level of normalcy across all invoices, um, including any for uh, detention and demurrage. So that required, there was 13 data elements in every invoice. It required invoices to be accurate or else they could be deemed uh you know the 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 payee would not have to pay them until they were um corrected uh obviously these are these are some that's a subjective term obviously and it's there's a whole set of dispute processes that are now in place um to to address those i think the problem in regulating this is i you know we could come up with 10 different hypothetical examples right now of uh you know D, D being potentially misappropriately applied and all 10 of those would be to 10 totally different problems right and so it's very hard to regulate a, a set of processes that have so many different permutations without creating a bunch of unintended consequences 
that might make that might be worse. You know, you don't want the cure to be worse than the than the disease, right? So I think the FMC has been the the Federal Maritime Commission has been quite deliberate in trying to figure out a way to get their arms around this in a way that doesn't make the problem worse. And one of those ways is earlier, just a couple months ago in, in February, I believe, um, they put out a rule. For, this was part of the OSRA, the aftermath of OSRA 22. They had to put out a rule about D&D &D invoicing. And uh, the, the major change in that rule that was announced, and it's, this goes into effect in, at the end of May, is uh, anyone charging detention to merge has to build a party that was that is in the contract. Earlier, I mentioned how often drainage providers end up getting the bill or having to pay a fee literally at the gate to get a to get a container out. That practice has to end now. If the ship the shipper has to be the one that's billed, doesn't mean the drainage provider or three PL or a customs broker can't pay that bill on their behalf. But the bill cannot be sent to those third parties that were not part of the original contract. So that is one uh, major change that I think a lot of people are gen generally happy with. It definitely, it's definitely a change of process for some shippers that have not been used to receiving bills and are now going to start receiving bills and have to pass them along to their providers if the providers are the ones who agree to pay, pay it on their behalf. Uh, but I think it's overall, it's a good thing for the intermediary community that essentially has been over the years fronting a lot of money and having to claw it back. And, and most of these companies are on pretty thin margins and don't necessarily have the cash flow to, to make that work. So th that would be the one that I would be focused on at this point. There's another set of, I had mentioned there's 13 data elements that now have to be in an invoice. There's also another seven elements that are set to be added, but they have to go through sort of a, a regulatory process within the US government, the o Office of OMB, I forget the acronym, St what it stands for, but that's sort of a uh, an, a hurdle that the those seven data elements have to go through. They have to go through uh, uh, scrutiny from that agency, and then that will be added. So we might have as many as 20 data elements that have to be on an invoice for it to be considered a valid detention to merge invoice. Yep. And, I, I'll, and one thing, and again, we could go on and on about just this topic. One thing that's important to understand on the dispute side of this is Ostra essentially created some new avenues for shippers uh, or shipper representatives to dispute charges they believe to be inaccurate or, or lacking that data invoice. There's now four channels essentially to dispute beyond just going back to the carrier or the terminal and saying, here, I have proof that this charge that you applied to me uh, is not valid. Uh, you can, and I won't go through all of them because again, that would take another 30 minutes, but there's, it sort of ranges from kind of like small claims court to all the way to formal process long-term process in front of the FMC, have them consider and, and adjudicate whether, you know, a, a shipper has been wronged essentially. So there's, there's a lot more channels in the, and the, the channels are meant to where appropriate expedite the process. So it's not a year's long process to try to get back what oftentimes is not a huge amount of money, but it's still, you know, inappropriately charged. Yeah. Very good. And while we're on uh, ASRA subject, Shalab, what exactly is ASRA compliance, and what are the impacts of not complying with it from your from your uh, uh, thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think Eric uh, covered uh, quite a few points on on that topic, uh, but I, I mean, um, OSRA is uh, Ocean Shipping Reform Act uh, came into picture in 2022 uh, when President Biden signed it, and uh, I think. Uh, uh, the the reason something of that sort had to come in uh, is because of all the global supply chain challenges uh, that were already in place uh, because of COVID. And the government was trying to soothe some of those challenges for shippers and BCOs, US-based importers. That was kind of further uh, delaying the availability of goods, consumer goods for uh, US consumers. Um, so I believe that uh, OSRA 
what was targeted towards building more accountability uh, on uh, uh, the shipping lines, uh, the terminal operators, MTOs, um, on um, building more visibility and transparency uh, in the entire process. And uh, definitely a right step in the direction in uh, putting more uh, frameworks uh, so that uh, the larger industry, because this is not just the shipper, as uh, Eric also mentioned, uh, quite a few stakeholders are involved in this entire chain, um, how uh, a framework can be adopted. And the idea was to give more authority uh, to FMC uh, to, to work on some of those new frameworks, which uh, recently also came into uh, implementation uh, uh, and uh, like is going to be an implementation from end of May. Um, so I think Osra was about um, uh, basically there, there were complaints that uh, shippers were being built, um, uh, let's say 30 days after a empty container has been uh, handed over back to the uh, terminal uh, and uh, they might be uh, getting bills with have, which have no details forever. Uh, whatsoever and uh, like drainage providers might be getting billed like multiple pa parties are receiving the bill right and there is no transparency or visibility in who who, who actually needs to uh, clear those charges um, and sometimes there was also another uh, another uh, angle to it where uh, some of the shippers felt that once they were disputing some of these charges they were discriminated against or they were not provided space on the uh, on, on the vessel uh, they were not provided good uh, contractual terms or they were asked to renegotiate on their existing terms right um, so i think this intervention by us government and fmc with osra uh, coming in uh, is good for the entire uh, entire industry uh, to build more accountability and like uh, streamline one of the challenges uh, that we have in global supply chains. And I, I believe maybe uh, more uh, such governments uh, in different parts of the world uh, might uh, might initiate something similar. Yeah. Getting back to Eric, uh, would you like to talk about Samsung charges on unlawful DD charge collections by Costco? Yeah. Uh... So this was a case uh, that was just filed at the beginning of April uh, 24 um, by Samsung, obviously a massive MNC that's also, a, you know, I believe a top 10 uh, U.S. importer. Um, and, you know, shall have just mentioned a couple different ways that D&D uh, &D might be incorrectly applied, right? One a, a invoice goes out to multiple parties. There's certainly scenarios where a shipper, its drainage provider, a third party, another third party are all getting the same invoice, often not necessarily maliciously. It's just the carrier wants to sort of spread its net to make sure someone is paying this invoice, right? And they don't, they aren't sure ultimately who the who the party that's most likely or who amongst those three parties has decided is going to pay the invoice. So that's that's one thing that the FMC tried to solve is let's ma let's make it clear who receives the invoice. And then that company that receives the invoice can decide with its own partners who is getting, uh, who's actually going to pay that bill. So you don't end up in a situation where multiple parties pay the same bill to the benefit of the carrier. Uh, the other one that, that Shala mentioned that I'll also highlight is the delay between when detention or demurrage happened and when a bill is received. We hear all the time from shippers, from drainage providers, that they will literally get bills on their desk six months, a year after uh, after this you know, infraction of free time essentially has happened. They have absolutely no way to research what happened with that particular box or set of boxes to determine whether it's even appropriate for them to pay it, much less I mean, try to think of like if you, you know, returned a library book 11 months ago and figure out if you were two or three days late on it or not. Right. Um, it's so it's it's uh, the, the FMC has tried to tackle those two problems. 
the the problem that came up in the case that you referenced with Samsung filing charges or filing a formal complaint against Costco and its subsidiary OCL with the FMC. Uh, by the way, no determination has been made yet. This is just the formal complaint process. So we we don't know whether Costco or OCL did anything wrong. But but what Samsung is accusing the the two carriers that are that are you know part of the same group uh, of doing is essentially assessing charges, D and D charges, when Samsung had no ability to to get access to its uh, containers. Um, so the, the these were, I believe, I was just looking at this case again to familiarize myself because I knew we might want to talk about this. This was on merchant haulage, which refers to when the shipper themselves organize uh, the dray leg of a of a a move. And essentially what Samsung is saying is it was impossible to organize drayage because the containers were just not being made available. And because out of in, in ways that were outside of Samsung or its drayage providers control and literally thousands of these cases. So 20 some odd thousand detention and emerge invoices um, being applied and so it wasn't an instance of one or two shipments and those boxes being affected, but over a, I believe a year and a half or two year period. Uh, and, and essentially Costco and OCL, according to Samsung was not willing to waive any of those fees. So, and then as, as Charlotte mentioned, they also allege in this complaint that they were retaliated upon with Costco denying them space on future sailings because of these unpaid bills. So this is a case of, uh, I think this is kind of in some ways a classic case of what, what I like to call the death by a thousand cuts problem in detention to merge where each individual invoice you receive might be a relatively small amount, but if you get 20,000 of them and you feel like they are not any of any fault of your own, it starts to really add up from a cost perspective, but also just from a supply chain fluidity perspective, right? Just imagine trying to sort out these, these might be small charges relative to tens of thousands of boxes that contain the goods that you're trying to move and, and keep moving in your supply chain, right? So um, it's, you know, it's, it's not the only case, obviously before the FMC, there are a lot of complaints before the FMC it's, it's not the only one related to Costco. I believe this is the fourth formal complaint uh, related to Costco before the FMC. So I think the FMC is, we, I mean, we've definitely heard them say they are starting to look at carriers for, in terms of a pattern, right? So it, if, if there is a pattern that's emerging, do they get treated a little bit more, you know, is the scrutiny a little bit more intense than if it's a first uh, sort of offense? Got it. Thank you. So Shalab, in your opinion, how is FMC's rule on D and D billing safeguarding shippers? Yeah, I think a few points which Eric touched upon, um, but to just to add more detail to some of them, uh, uh, the FMC's new ro rule, which is in line with OSRA, uh, is uh, going to be implemented starting May twenty eighth this year, and uh, basically uh, FMC through this rule is. Uh, has kind of identified requirements for shipping lines and MTOs, uh, like terminal operators, um, on first of all, who can be built, um, right? So um, uh, what what we were discussing that earlier, multiple parties were sent these invoices, but now they can either invoice to the actual consignee uh, or BCO, or they can invoice to the contracting party, like the one, the party who contracted with this shipping line or terminal. Right? Um, this can't be sent to any other outside of them. Uh, the second uh, uh, thing that they have tried to address through this rule is that when these invoices can be raised. So I think as per the requirement, uh, an invoice has to be raised, uh, raised within 30 days of the charges being actually incurred, right? Which I think uh, really is going to uh, build a lot more transparency uh, and a lot more like would help in the overall fluidity 
uh, visibility for everyone. Um, and the third is the um, uh, mitigation or, or uh, dispute process overall, right? So basically, every shipper or consignee gets at least 30 days to raise their disputes, uh, request for waiver, right? And then uh, after such request being raised, uh, the uh, terminal operators or, con or uh, shipping lines have to come up with uh, some kind of resolution within next 30 days, right? Or they have to mutually agree on a uh, timeline, right? So I think FMC, uh, as uh, Eric also mentioned, they are trying to identify some of the core challenges around D&D &D and trying to address them by uh, identifying these requirements. Um, I think uh, the other point also, which we discussed that there are multiple uh, channels to raise disputes, uh, not just uh, uh, raising and like doing an invoice dispute with the shipping line, but there are other channels where one can go uh, for relief. And uh, uh, being more specific about what kind of information has to be uh, there in the invoice uh, uh, to give details to this consignee about an invoice being raised, right? And uh, 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 they, I think, as, as Eric mentioned, there are at least seven or 13 different data points uh, which they need to be clear about. Otherwise, this D&D &D invoice would be nullified. So these are all the, I think, um, uh, what, what is going to be implemented soon. And uh, uh, I think it's a welcome change for the, for the industry. Next question for Eric. Can you share more on how the Baltimore situation is having unexpected D&D charges on shippers? Oh, yeah, Baltimore. Uh, everyone's favorite topic these days in the <laughs> US. Uh, okay, so, you know, if you think about any sort of situation where a uh, a terminal, much less an entire port, is closed for any period of time, uh, there's all there's all sorts of questions about when does free time start? When does it pause? Is there sort of leniency given from the billing party because of, you know, a, a situation completely out of out of everyone's control in this case, right? So uh, we've seen shipping lines kind of declare force majeure, which means I think within the context of D&D, &D, they are not, uh, you know, they are, the, the laws of the contract for a particular shipment are not necessarily as applicable. So um, you obviously in, in, in Baltimore, you have a lot of containers that were temporarily tied up in a terminal that were supposed to move uh, out on an, on an outgoing ship or were due to come in and are now at a different port, coming into a different port on the import side, tied up temporarily on the export side and have had to be moved off of that terminal to another port, right? So it really comes down, I think this is a situation where it really comes down to what type of relationship you as a shipper and your drayage providers have with the terminals you use and the shipping lines you use. Because if you are a transactional shipper who rarely uses this, this terminal and this drayage provider or this carrier, you're going to have a harder time calling them or emailing them and saying, hey, can we figure out what the right way to handle free time is given the situation that evolved? Like we are, we don't intend to exceed our free time any more than we absolutely have to, but there's been a, you know, a sort of historic incident. Whereas if you have a relationship set aside with those people or those companies, you're probably going to figure out a way that sort of suits all parties to the best um, resolution everyone recognizing this was a situation beyond everybody's control. And that said, you know, the FMC kind of came out a couple of weeks after, maybe within a week after the, the bridge was, was uh, collapsed and said, they're going to be monitoring what they consider anti-competitive assessments of, of fees. And that would include D and D um, to make sure that no one is taking advantage of the situation. Um, on, on all parties, I think, right? So on all sides. So um, I think the short-term impact is just, it's very important to have relationships with your with your service providers and make sure that you can kind of come to an agreeable re resolution. 
uh, and not let this spiral into some cost center uh, that that you were not anticipating um, purely purely out of the fault of no one that you may be attached to. Um, and then long term, I think this just resolves once the channel is opened and things start to flow flow more normally. Got it. Thank you. And uh, Shalab, why do you think there is a lack of transparency as far as D&D is concerned? Uh, is it because of revenue for vessel companies or do you think it's something else? Uh, so I think naturally there were incentives for uh, uh, shipping lines uh, to not to have a lot of transparency and like each one having their own process of billing and uh, own way of calculating D and D charges, um, and obviously there were not uh, acts like OSRA, a new FMC rule uh, in in place to standardize these things. Uh, the other thing I believe is that I think to some degree D and D calculation is also complex. Uh, the data points that you need um, on different ports and terminals are different. Uh, they come from different stakeholders. Uh, the contracting terms are sometimes complex. Uh, there is a, a fine letter which needs to be introduced, uh, understood, and uh, someone needs to have a clear understanding of uh, how, in different scenarios, uh, these contracting terms can impact their DND charges, which I think we cannot expect from every other shipper. So um, I think. Uh, these were all like some of the reasons why I believe, and maybe this was not a very major problem five years back or uh, eight, seven years back, but it has become a major problem triggered by port congestion and all the other disruptions which were happening um, and be become a major expense uh, item, uh, line item for uh, uh, shippers. Uh, and I think that is when the industry started uh, asking for more transparency and uh, yeah. Thank you. Then uh, the last question is for both Eric and Shalab and any recommendations or guidance for our viewers? Eric? Uh, so I think uh, I just sort of mentioned relationships being a, a key part of, of kind of resolving some of these things. It's it's obviously not the only thing. I, I There's one case that sticks out in my head and I, I won't name the shipping line because I my memory thinks it's one, but I don't want to blame them for this. So I will just say a shipping line. This is the perfect example of how you need, you definitely need technology and you need to make sure your data feeds are as robust and accurate as possible to manage this. But technology alone doesn't solve the situation. And so uh, the, the, the story that sticks in my head is there was a case where a shipping line sent a notice, an arrival notice that in their contract triggered the start of free time to a, uh, a drainage provider on, that was working on behalf of the shipping, of the shipper. The ocean carrier had a, some sort of automated platform that determined the right email address to send this arrival notice to. That, and they kept pinging the same address, the same address that was automatically generated. It was not keyed in by someone in their finance or invoice department. It was sent to the wrong person who has no responsibility for managing arrival notices. You know, a shipping line put in technology to help sort of streamline its ability to get invoices out to the right party, but a glitch in that system created in a scenario where it didn't inform the, the party that needed to know when free time kicked in so that they could accurately, you know, pull out their containers that incurred detention or demurrage, I should say, that the shipper and its drainage provider felt were inappropriately applied. And that escalated all the way to the FMC, right? So you need a mixture of technology and people with expertise to manage that technology. Yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, great points, Eric. And, um, uh... Uh, just to add, I, I also uh, strongly believe that a uh, lot more uh, transparency uh, and uh, data management is required on account of shippers. 
because eventually uh, they are the ones who are going to bear this cost. So uh, it definitely makes sense uh, uh, for them to invest either in technology or in processes uh, to understand their demolition detention charges. Um, I believe that um, with these uh, new compliances coming in, there will be um, uh, there will be better mitigation of uh, some of these challenges. But like some new disruptions keep coming in, like we were discussing Baltimore, right? And there could be some other new disruptions, new new case, right? And uh, this could be this could be a huge cost uh, if not being managed well. So. Uh, and there will be other challenges, of course, uh, in the overall shipping in future. So this could be one thing which could be now well addressed with the right set of technology and tools in place. Thank you. Well, that uh, was very educational. Thank you both for your time. Highly appreciate it. Take thank care. Thank you for having me. It's always great to talk with you. Thanks, Eric. Thank Thanks, Mike.